Thanks, everybody, for joining us for this Friday's episode of Trade the Chain. Um, joined here by my co-host, uh, Ryan Gorman, best air in crypto. And we got CJ and Monty, our crypto analysts from MarketRebellion.com, uh, who are going to run through the uh, really important stuff. But first, we're going to go to the big boards today. We're going to check out BTC and ETH and see what's uh, moving them. Uh, we're not moving them, but there has been quite a bit of uh, price action, a little volatility going on in markets. And I'd like to say that we've spent nearly 100 days uh, above $10,000 in Bitcoin, and that's uh, quite a feat on its own. So um, after that, we'll go to our hot or not list. We only have uh, one on each list today, but I can tell you our hot list uh, is Audius, uh, Ticker's Audio, and that was a big, that was a big hot this week. Um, and then finally, in our news section, we're going to hit out uh, the news section, the exciting news today, uh, this week that happened, which was Avante, but we'll get to all that right after we go to the big boards. CJ Monte, what do we have on uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum this week? So before we go straight into Bitcoin, I want to say a little something about the traditional markets and the S&P 500 specifically, because we always talk about the correlation between these markets and whether or not Bitcoin actually does have enough momentum to decouple and thrive in the midst of a decreasing uh, equity market. So one of the analysts who uh, we respect very much and was just at our conference is uh, Raul Powell, who has been uh, one of the top Goldman Sachs uh, macro analysts back in the day. Now he does real vision in his own thing. But his framework is kind of this unfolding in three stages. The first stage is known as the liquidity crisis, which happened in March, where we went down. That's what happened. Um, subsequently, that phase has entered, and we entered into the second phase, which is the hope phase. And that's where we rally all the way back up after the Fed injects massive amounts of liquidity into the markets. But now we are nearing the third and possible final stage, which is the stage of mass banking insolvencies uh, globally. So this is a very uh, dangerous type of thing. And, and I am by no means a expert in macro strategy. I'm, my expertise is more in uh, short term weekly swing trading, but the market is starting to respond to this thesis and reflect uh, things that analysts like Raul Powell are saying. And so what I'm looking for on the S&P 500, very carefully here, we've double topped but now we are finding support at the 128 period moving average. And then finally, we have the 200 period moving average. So uh, these are critical support levels. And I, I see the S&P continuing to fall because I, I don't believe that our economy has fully caught up when it comes to the fundamentals of these macro trends. So how does this all play into Bitcoin? What does it mean? Well, it means that uh, Bitcoin as of now, in like the last week, is showing us that it has the strength to be able to thrive in the midst of a decreasing equity market. And that's exactly what we've seen with this bullish price action. So where are we going from here? What do I think is going to happen to Bitcoin in the next interim cycle? Well, we reached our nine, but it wasn't necessarily a peak of the trend, as you noticed right here. It, it was it was dangerous and it was a warning sign when it occurred. But then once we got bullish price action uh, right afterwards and, and immediately kind of consolidated above this 3,400 level or, or 13,400 level, we showed that Bitcoin has enough bullish consolidation to kind of form this bull flag and potentially test uh, 14,000. And since we are only on a four out of nine green sequential, I think we are still likely to test 14K and possibly break above it. Now, preparing for the downside, mm -hmm. I see critical support at 12,700. I don't want to go below 12,700. I think if price goes below that critical support level, you're probably going to have a chance to buy it back even cheaper at 12.1 or 12 even. So that's Sorry. a little bit of the macro and short run on Bitcoin. Sorry to cut you off there. Uh, you made an interesting point about uh, uh, the bank insolvency stage and the potential for 
uh, equities to go down significantly further. There's been a noticeable decoupling of the correlation between equities and Bitcoin that's quite obvious as seen on these charts, right? Um, so part of the part of what people are saying, you know, experts in the space, there's been a lot of positive news for Bitcoin recently, and that could be what's driving the rally. Uh, do you think that the uncertainty around the elections, the potential for uh, uh, banks to uh, come up lame like they did during the Great Recession, uh, are also contributing to this? Yes, because the election is no one knows what exactly the market's going to do, and um, I think there are. I mean, this is. I don't want to get political about it. This isn't a political channel, but there are those who speculate the market would react negatively to a democratic elected president due to potential corporate taxes that would impact earnings and the way that stocks respond to earnings then. So being said, I think there may be a lot of people in traditional finance that are sitting on the sidelines for the next week, uh, waiting until we get this further presidential election. But I certainly think it could be a catalyst of uncertainty that may continue to drive the market down further. But I'm not, a, I, I do not own the truth. I do not have a crystal ball. This is just what I'm speculating on. Yeah, and CJ, I mean, well, you know, we're going into a really interesting uh, week right now. And um, with the elections, uh, you know, there's definitely going to be, I think everybody can expect uh, volatility both in uh, traditional markets, but especially in the crypto markets going in. And to your point about, you know, a democratic uh, win and that affecting it in one way or another, I mean, um, that could have some ramifications possibly on, you know, companies like MicroStrategies and Square and what their, what their uh, belief was in going to Bitcoin and all that. Um, I mean, this is going to be exciting. I, you know, I, I just mentioned on, on uh, the another episode that, you know, we have a lot of our hedge fund clients going into, uh, you know, hitting up Deribit for options ahead of the election. Some some big swinging betters, uh, you know, to what you're saying, hoping to come out on the on the right side of that trade. Yeah, and I think today makes a great point when he like talks about this. I mean, this macro run up just feels very different than anything we've seen in the past, right? Like. In the 2017 run-up, that was a very euphoric and manic run-up. This feels a lot more sustained. And I think a lot of it has to do with the things that you mentioned, the news-related incidents. And this seems like a more, um, 2017 was when like the public and the consumer became aware of Bitcoin and tried to grab it all up. And this is more like an institutional understanding of the value of Bitcoin. And I think that's making for a very sustained growth. And like CJ said, it was decoupling. It's starting, it's starting to look like it's decoupling from traditional financial markets, which may be good um, following the uncertainty in, of the election. I think, like CJ said, if a Democratic pres president is elected, I think traditional equity markets will be hit very hard. And I think this decoupling, along with the maturity of the Bitcoin space, may actually allow Bitcoin to kind of stay up while the equity market turns down. Absolutely. This, this run-up feels much more gradual and deliberate, and uh, uh, the fundamentals behind it are much stronger than just uh, FOMO and uh, ICOs, for sure. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and you know, Monty is famous on here for taking his uh, great market time, short positions, you know, he's not going to have any fun for the short term, but that's okay. Uh, moving on to Ethereum, what do we have going on with Ethereum? Is it, is it sticking by the heels of Bitcoin? Is it doing its own thing? And uh, are we any DeFi positive or negative uh, facts, effects happening to it this week? Yeah, Ethereum is an interesting case here this week because it is, I mean, we're so used to seeing it move in tandem with Bitcoin and seeing all other crypto assets kind of move in tandem with Bitcoin, but we're starting to see a little bit of difference here. And I think, I think we will start to see that pattern emerge again, where they, where they move in tandem. But I think right now what's sort of happening is a lot of people are rushing to buy Bitcoin. And one way that people are doing that is moving equity from Ethereum into uh, Bitcoin. So I think that right now, a lot of the hype is around Bitcoin with all this institutional news and all the, um, just to talk about it amongst major institutions, I think we're starting to see uh, other crypto holders, people that are have been ETH holders their whole lives, start to maybe trim a little bit of their ETH holdings and put that into Bitcoin. So, 
Uh, there was a story making the rounds earlier this week, maybe yesterday or the day before, about how there's now $2 billion worth of uh, Bitcoin locked on Ethereum. Uh, do you think that that's potentially limiting the downside risk for Ethereum, or uh, do you think it's uh, amplifying it? Oh, no, I definitely think it mitigates the downside risk. And and that's part of the reason why I think eventually they'll start moving in tandem again. Um, exactly, yeah. They're, they're so strongly related. That, like you said, that's such a $2 billion is such a large amount of equity locked up on the blockchain. It almost guarantees its survival as long as Bitcoin survives. So yeah, I do think it uh, kind of is a safety net for Ethereum, definitely. And uh, one statistic that possibly backs up what Monty said earlier about how the Bitcoin run-up has been more driven by institutionals, uh, institutional investors is because there are more addresses with 1,000 Bitcoin or more uh, than there ever have been in existence. So there's a couple things we could infer from that, but I think the most likely is that institutions and larger players from traditional finance are getting into the space. But when it comes to Ethereum and its price action, uh, Monty's right, it, they work in tandem. Um, they're very closely related. The reason why I think Ethereum has been lagging behind Bitcoin is because we're seeing, uh, like Bitcoin, we're seeing increase drastically over the past couple of weeks. And I think that money from DeFi in the projects like Uni and UMA, um, things that require the participation of Ethereum to increase, um, those have been bleeding out severely. And the DeFi hype, while it is still intact, some of the price action has been severely bearish as a result. So I think that has locked or has uh, kind of got flown into Ethereum and affected it in bearish price action, whereas Bitcoin has kind of been uh, neutral bullish still. Looking at DeFi real quickly, uh, the, the, the average DeFi project, I think I saw a statistic somewhere, they're down like 20% off their highs, if not more. Uh, do you think that's a result of the hype dying down and people realizing that some of these projects have more utility than others? Or do you think it's just the tokens settling in to their fair valuations and natural trading range? Yeah, I think you could definitely attribute it to both. I mean, we talked last week about how like these, these coins, these tokens need to be priced in, right? When they're, when they're released, there's all this initial hype around it. Um, and that drives the price up. But then eventually um, it kind of needs to find its true value. And uh, I think that's what we're seeing happen with a lot of these coins. Also, we're seeing, like, uh, like I mentioned earlier, kind of that capital flowing into Bitcoin as well. So, I mean, there's just less incentive to, um, to be investing in these tokens right now. At the start, there was tremendous upside potential and that was reflected in like rapid upward price action. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think now these, these tokens are selling into their true value and the hype is dying down. But yeah, maybe once their use case becomes more um, like prevalent and becomes more, um, it becomes more valuable of a use case, then we'll start to see massive rebounds. But yeah, I think for now it's just, it's just uh, an instance of these tokens finding their true value. Makes sense. I mean, yeah, Ryan, Monty, and I'm looking at the charts as uh, they're scrolling across the screen here of uh, DeFi projects while Monty was explaining this, and it's it, it's 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 stunning. I mean, quite honestly, it's stunning on the trajectory that these uh, coins took uh, with all the hype, and then ultimately just complete deflation, you know, of any sort of substance uh, beneath them. It's it's crazy. Um, go, you know, going on to our hotter not list, um, our hot list is Audius, uh, tickers audio. And I'm actually going to let Ryan lead off with this one. Cause he got really excited last week, um, uh, on this huge, huge jump. Yeah. Uh, users of our trade the chain platform, uh, got an alert shortly before that, uh, this listed and they were able to realize significant uh, gains uh, on this token. I mean, it's still up 24%, but look at how high it shot up after the listing. And basically, Audius is a decentralized platform that has found a way to tokenize usage uh, and uh, the uh, upload of music, uh, similar to a way that uh, SoundCloud does. And it's uncensored, and uh, you, it gives you a much bigger platform than you would otherwise have if you tried to distribute on Spotify and go through their process. I personally used Audius. I think it's a great platform. I, uh, I, I think it really uh, opens up opportunity for a number of uh, independent artists as well as uh, mainstream ones. 
And uh, if you if you listen to EDM like I do, and a lot of other people in crypto do, I think you know it's it's a great place to discover new music. But uh, as far as the price action is concerned, I'll let the experts handle that. Yeah, I mean, you know, this one really had, uh, you know, too little data really to go over TAs. Um, so, you know, Monty and uh, uh, CJ get a break from this um, uh, this one. But yeah, to, to, to Ryan's point, it, it, the Binance effect, it's originally it was called the Coinbase effect, but I, I do think that it's the Binance effect. Um, it, it's just really tremendous. And so... It, it never, it, 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 this is one of those event driven price actions um, where there may or may not be a lot of sustainability behind it. We often don't see um, a lot of sustainability between price action uh, on coins that just go up because of a listing. Um, so we'll, we'll see how this turns out, but boy, big moves, big moves, uh, and not such a bad platform either. More um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, 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 recently, uh, 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 the Thai, our, our friend Josh at the Thai, uh, did some joint research with uh, eToro, and uh, uh, exchange listings were shown. You know, they, they they provide a temporary price pop, similar to what happens in DeFi. To your point, right? But then eventually they go down until utility is found for a project. This project does have real utility, and I think that's why. Once it did go down after that initial hype sell-off, it's, it's kind of started to rebound a bit and found uh, a little bit of support, it looks like. Um, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll know more in the next couple of weeks, but I, I think that this one could be a more long-term sustainable uh, uh, pop versus uh, a hot dog or, uh, or sushi. <laughs> yeah, well, or, or tomato coin or my edamame coin that I'm dreaming of making. But uh, yeah, no, look for DJ Ryan Gorman. He'll be dropping his next hit on uh, audio. Um, and we'll see how that uh, how that goes. Um, you know, next is our not list. Uh, it's uh, Golem GNT is a ticker, and um, you know this one is uh, this one's facing uh, some tough times right now. Um, uh, CJ Monty, what do we got going on here? So this oh. is uh, just a technical setup that I really like in trading. It's known as the descending triangle. And uh, typically that's characterized by about three touch points on this higher descending trend line. And then, uh, you know, as well as touch points on this uh, support level at the bottom here. And once you break the support level of the descending triangle, um, that is typically characteristic that we're going to continue in this bullish or in this bearish pattern uh, for, for quite some time. Um, so, being on a uh, red sequential six, I think we got at least three to four more days of bearish price action after we've already fallen down from this descending triangle. Um, just a technical formation, nothing necessarily fundamental about this project that I'm trading, um, but this is the trade setup that I decided to pick and choose. It is refreshing right. to have some technical driven coins when we have so many news related incidents. I think uh, you kind of got to hunt for these coins that aren't being affected by the news right now. But yeah, this is a, a classic technical setup and it looks like the price is following perfectly. I mean, no, and you're absolutely right, um, uh, Monty. And, and, and just to look at the, uh, the chart patterns on that coin since it had that strong uh, hop to the, to the high side, um, I mean, it's, it's almost classic T, TA right there. Indeed. Absolutely. All right. Well, next on, we are going to the news piece. And this one is regarding Avanti. Uh, Avanti has just gotten approved um, by the state of Wyoming for their banking license. They're following in the footsteps of Kraken's approval, which happened uh, uh, earlier in the quarter. Um, but, but, you know, uh, we have Caitlin Long here in charge of uh, Avanti. She's been um, you know, she, she's been involved with the regulators for, for quite some time in blockchain and crypto. And this had started out as a, I think it's been a year. Has it been a year since uh, she started Avanti, Ryan? I think two years, maybe. Closer. Jeez, it has been two years. That's right. It, it happened like uh, crypto winter time or, or something, uh, 2018. I mean, geez, time's flying. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, Ryan, to, uh, explain this. How, how is this? Go First of all, I think this is kick butt news for the industry as a whole, right? Second bank with the state uh, banking or second firm with the state banking license. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Break this down for us. Sure. So here, 
similar to Kraken, they've been approved, uh, uh, well, they've been given a bank charter, right? But uh, as the article notes, uh, uh, despite this being very good bullish long-term news for the industry, neither Kraken nor uh, Avanti are able to actually operate as a bank yet. They don't have their certificate of authority to operate because they need to raise more money. They need to be a bit more organized. But I think, you know, when you're looking to form a bank, especially when it comes to crypto assets or digital assets, you first need to have this charter. And then that, that's when you start taking those next steps to be able to operate. It looks like they'll be op able to operate uh, as a bank uh, closer to uh, next year, probably the first quarter of next year. Um, I'm not an insider by any means, but just oh, wow. how the process works. It's not like they uh, flip on the lights today and they're a crypto bank and they start taking so, so that quickly, that quickly, they, they're thinking next year. I mean, because it seems like the process takes so long. And, and also, do you know that when they um, get, you know, they get that approval to operate as a bank, does that mean they get approval to operate as like a bank bank? Like, can Joe Schmo go in there and open up a checking account like he can at Chase or, or Bank of America? Uh, as far as I know, when you're a chartered bank, you're a chartered bank, right? You can take deposits, you can transact, you can do merchant services. A bank is a bank is a bank. So uh, I think uh, once they're able to uh, uh, finally operate as a bank, it'll be huge news for uh, the crypto industry. And another important point is uh, the banking board approved uh, their uh, a future issuance of a VIT, which is a uh, uh, crypto uh, asset that they've created that's basically pegged to the U.S. dollar. So uh, it sounds like they've created a competitor to Signature's Signet platform. And or JPM's coin that launched, I mean, right? Exactly. And people would be able to, to send remittances and transact in that, that currency, that digital currency. Uh, but it will not be publicly traded. It will not be an investment. It will not generate returns. It's mainly just meant as a medium of uh, transfer. So I think I, the thing there is building a nice uh, a competitor to, to Signature Bank, it looks like. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And, and, you know, and people out there, there's, there's a few banks that have had, had their own coins out for a while. Um, JPM has developed their own, uh, Wells Fargo, uh, sneakily created their own and, uh, actually uh, tested it, um, uh, almost two years ago. But basically what these coins are is they're made for internal, internal settlement purposes. So they're, it's not made to trade like a Bitcoin or Ethereum. It's made for uh, movements uh, to be able to be made on blockchain, whether it's internal uh, trade settlements or cash settlements and stuff like that. This coin utilizes it as a, um, you know, uh, immutable ledger. So uh, this is awesome, awesome news. I mean, I'm super psyched. I can't wait to, uh, to join a digital bank. But then on the other hand, Ryan, does this, if a bank is a bank is a bank, it's just, just a fancy, different way of becoming a regular bank. I mean, yeah, isn't that what the crypto industry needs? We need regular banks. And in order for institutions to uh, participate more, and in order for businesses to be able to conduct on a larger scale, we need banks. And I think another important point about the AV token that I wanted to mention is that Currently, the complaint about sending money uh, and uh, using ACH or wire transfers is that, is that they take too long. We can send an email anywhere in the world or hop on a video chat with anyone in the world instantly. Communication is instant, but money takes days. You're better off putting money in a suitcase, hopping on a flight to London and you know, handing the money to someone in person rather than trying to send it electronically. And I think you know the signature signet platform, JPM coin, they aim to solve that problem. And you know you can use it in trade finance, you can use it in securities finance. There's a number of different applications that you can use that having a bank issue a token like this and bring it to the mainstream enable broader adoption of the industry and they just further blockchain and crypto as a whole, right? So I think this is a huge development and it bodes very well for the future of the industry. It's just we're not going to realize the benefits of it for quite some time. At least it's a start, though. I won't be too old when it materializes. Before we can walk, right? I think, uh, <laughs> I think where this is leading from a much broader mm -hmm. point of view is central bank digital currencies. Because if the Fed can create something known as FedCoin that runs uh, and and you can give liquidity to people and send it around the world. Like you mentioned, Ryan, you're better off hopping on a, an airplane and flying with a suitcase full of cash. But if 
the Fed comes out and releases FedCoin where they give Americans or citizens uh, the ability to open up a free bank account, that sort of makes the commercial banking industry obsolete. And so that's why JP Morgan and Fidelity, they want uh, their own crypto asset in the form of a stable coin so that you can send it internationally and also use it as an excellent form of capital due to the transparency or collateral. I mean. yeah. So there's all of those things that they want. And go ahead. I'm sorry, you, you froze. That's why I uh, interjected. Um, but I, I guess that's a good point. But I think there are those people who are also concerned about censorship of their money and surveillance by the government that would never use a CBDC, right? I don't want the, the government knowing what I spend money on. I mean, it's not like I, I have anything that shady that I'm doing with cash, but they don't need to know I bought a candy bar or a beer with a $20 bill. Like, it's none of their business, right? So uh, that's a great point, Ryan. Be, uh, yeah. You won't have the option to choose. If FedCoin becomes the standard, uh, you will have to use that. And your only option for cash will be something like Bitcoin or a various other cryptocurrency. So I see a world where both of them sort of coexist. What, what do you guys think? I'm, that's why I'm stockpiling Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, but now what, if, if, we're, if we're talking about, you know, that's what the ultimate dream dominance is of the banks. So what are we talking about with XRP and Stellar? Are those, are those just going to become obsolete then? Um, perhaps. I don't want to piss off the XRP army. Uh, I don't want to piss off the XRP army. But I mean, I just, uh, this, this, is, this is the thing about XRP and banks using it, right? The only reason why an asset goes up in value is if people buy it and stockpile it like Ryan holding his, uh, his Bitcoin. People, or, or specifically banks and financial institutions that are using the XRP settlement layer, they're not speculating on the price of XRP. They're locking it in for one transaction and then cashing out. So does that speculation actually increase the price if no one's ever holding it? I don't, I don't know. That's not a, a certain question. Yeah. Let, me, uh, let me ask this. You bring up a good point about speculation, right? First of all, I don't think uh, cross-border transactional currency should be speculated on. I think it should be pegged, okay? Because it starts deriving too many other things like investment coin or something like that. It shouldn't be. So, I mean, to me, it just sounds like, um, XR, uh, you know, like XRP doesn't sound that stellar to me. Oh, okay. we get <laughs> all right, all right, we're done. We'll go with folks. <laughs> now, all good points, guys. All good points, man. And um, uh, you know, another great episode. Another week down the books. Uh, hoping everybody has a great weekend. Um, do not forget to go over to uh, Monty and CJ's uh, uh, site, uh, MarketRebellion.com uh, forward slash Bitcoin. I was going to ask him at the end today if there was any new developments. Uh, they're launching very soon, but I know they're hard at work. They're growing beards. They can't even shave. It's not even on the agenda. Um, but I know that I know that we're going to get something really awesome soon. And they're pulling up some stuff right now. So let's see what we got. Yeah, I'll just uh, I'm going to just show you a sneak peek of the dev environment here. Got to log in. So. But uh, this is not in our current beta release. So this is actually brand new, but I just want to show you the possibility of multi-chart functionality that we have. So we have the ability for multiple charts uh, as well as our chat and watch list here um, that can be uh, you know, adjusted. And then we have our trade insights that can be found at the bottom here as well that can be uh, adjusted upward if you want. Um, over here, we got a list of all of our indicators. Uh, I'm not gonna go too far into this, but that's a nice uh, little taste of what we're gonna have going, um, mm -hmm. but very cool stuff. Well, I th first of all, I think that that GUI right there looks really awesome. I like the look and feel of it, especially the whole color scheme uh, and stuff like that. And what I, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk uh, we're gonna talk these guys into uh, doing um, an episode in the future where he is gonna run through all that because I want to know um, to show all the features uh, of charting and and the tools of the TA. I saw the integrated chat. Gotta have that. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Guys, uh, let's do an episode for that. Really want to show everybody that because it's been exciting. I think I've been I've been waiting on on this to happen for over a year now. Um, <laughs> and I know, 
<laughs> I know it's going to be great. Um, but yeah, go visit them, marketerbuying.com forward slash Bitcoin. That's the only thing there is, right? Um, and uh, everybody have a great weekend. Uh, we will catch you next Friday. Um, and that's that. Thanks, guys. Tradethechain.com for all those alerts that we talked about during the show. Don't forget. Absolutely. Thank you, Ryan. Ha, 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 ha.